So you can bring up another one, which then will uh, bind here and start to form beta structure coming out. This is a sort of a beta slab or a beta sheet model of aggregation, but it doesn't have to follow such a slab picture, uh, particularly following the suggestions of Max Peretz, the Nobel laureate, um, about six or seven years ago. He suggested that the, the relevant structure for the poly Q diseases, the Huntington's disease and so on, is a, is a beta helical structure. Now, it's probably not circular like this, but this gives you the idea that you basically form beta contacts as you wrap around in this spiral, and you have a, a much bigger pitch, uh, sorry, you have a much bigger repeat unit to this spiral than you do in an alpha helix, where it's uh, basically four amino acids. Um, and then, once you form such a beta helix, you can again lay another one on top of it, again, satisfying the hydrogen bonds off the edge of the beta helix. So by having all these hungry hydrogen bonds on either side of a beta slab like this or on top of a beta helix like that or whatever beta structure you can imagine, it gives you the possibility of joining proteins together edge to edge on the betas. And that's why, uh, probably why the, the, the beta structure is so generic to, uh, to protein aggregation. So a little bit about um, poly Q diseases and why they might be amenable to such biophysical treatments. This is not all of the poly Q diseases. This is Huntington's disease. Um, what this is is that in these proteins, you wind up with continuous stretches of just glutamine being expressed. So you have you have uh, in your protein you have just some copies of adjacent repeats of glutamine, which is encoded for by the codon CAG in the, in the DNA. And what has been found for these poly Q diseases, and this is a very nice review you can look up, uh, what's been found, I think it's actually included also in the uh, packets of papers that we posted online for people. Um, what you find is that there's an incredibly re reproducible correlation between the number of the repeat units and the age at onset of the disease. So for example, if you focus on the most famous one, Huntington's disease, which is the disease that killed the uh, folk singer, uh, Woody Guthrie, who wrote, this land is your land. Um, if you have a number of repeats below about 40, you're pretty much safe. And as you get to around 40, the disease uh, sets in in a human lifespan window. And as you increase the number of repeats, you can even get to a situation where there have been observations out here at 120 glutamines where you wind up getting the disease in sort of your early years, ages two or three, something like that. These curves are very similar between the different diseases. And again, they, they're highly reproducible. Uh, there, there's enough instance of these cases that you can, you can get these nice uh, correlations. I can show you the other five diseases and it will look very much the same. So I'm going to uh, now show you a, um, a plot of an in vivo I'm sorry, an in vitro experiment that was done by Chen, Theron, and Wetzel. The reference is here. Uh, what they did was they made up um, sets of poly Q and threw it in a test tube. So in other words, they didn't take the full Huntington protein, which is a huge protein. They just took the, the glutamine repeat part of the of Huntington protein. They threw it in a test tube, and they, they varied the concentrations, and they varied the length. So for example, this was length 45, this was length 37, and this was length uh, 25. Right here. And this is ours, and these are pretty high concentrations. And what they saw was they began to get aggregation of the uh, peptide on the time scale in, in an amyloid form on the time scale of ours. And notice that they, these look like fairly simple curves. I'll say a little bit more about that in just a minute. And I'll come back to this plot after I give you some, some theory background on the blackboard to describe this. But what you can notice is you can notice a couple of things. One is that if you decrease the length of the uh, peptide, going from 45 here to 25 over here, the time scale for aggregation increases. You might ask, how did they measure this aggregation? They did it a couple different ways, but one common way to do it is to take a dye, like thioflavin. You can attach the thioflavin, and it will bind to amyloid, sort of monomer by monomer, so that the fluorescence of the dye will give you a direct measure of how much of the amyloid aggregate you have present. Um, so you, you increase the time scales, you decrease the length. And um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this picture in just a minute. 
But this is a very simple curve right here. And if you didn't take my class this last quarter, and hint to those of you from Davis sitting in the audience, what would you guess is the functional form for that? What's the simplest functional form that can give you this shape? Sorry? One. Quadratic. Exactly. You win the prize. And you were not in my class. We will verify that. But <laughs> separate analysis. OK. Yes, it's actually a, uh, a t squared form. So the, uh, the amount of aggregate, the amount of monomer and polymer form goes as t squared. Now that's sort of interesting, but there's more you can learn from that. If you vary the concentration, you can actually learn something about the nucleus to, to drive this aggregation process. And so now I'm going to spend a little bit of time going into this analysis. Um, and it also connects to whether that aggregation process is what we call um, thermodynamically controlled or kinetically controlled. So what I want to do now is, is spend a little bit of time at the blackboard and uh, go through a few, um, few concepts that are useful in thinking about, about aggregation. And this is about self-assembly, by the way. So again, I, I'm going to be talking here about self-assembly versus directed assembly. I should uh, do a, a brief aside on directed assembly. Uh, in directed assembly, um, you, you take, for example, um, tubulin, and you use energy from uh, ATP to assemble that tubulin in a 1D uh, polymer or filament. Uh, and you, by using the energetics, you can actually control the direction of growth. And typically, you find that, that the, the direction, sorry, that the, uh, the growth has a different rate and a different, the growth will occur on one side and the detachment or the, uh, the, the dissolution will occur on the other side. And so when you have things like this, First of all, you can form long-lasting structures if you want to, but secondly, you can actually use them to direct the growth of cells, to direct the growth or motion of cells. Um, so you have, when you have energetic control, those are the things that are useful in cell development and cell motility. Um, when you make permanent structures of them, those are the things that are useful for, um, in the cytoskeleton, becoming the highways for transporting motor proteins. They're useful for directing meiosis of cells. And again, I want to postpone that to the, to the discussion you're going to hear from uh, Alex Wilkilner, who's a, a, a leading expert on uh, this kind of thing. And I'm going to be talking about self-assembly. And I want to distinguish the self-assembly in two categories. I want to talk about what I call uh, thermodynamically controlled self-assembly. And I want to distinguish that from what I'll call kinetic controlled self-assembly. And just a little bit about that. Um, the idea of the thermodynamic control is that you might have a picture like this, where you have your free energy going up this way. In some sense, both conformation, I made a little loose about what the reaction coordinate axis is here, but conformation and uh, the, the number of monomers in a polymer are going this way, because once you aggregate, you also confer the structure. You also confer the order. So the idea of the thermodynamic control is that we have a metastable nucleus which is uh, thermodynamically accessible. That is, that this energy is not so far away from KVT that this delta G is not so far away from KVT that you can't access this critical nucleus. And then this is the unfolded minimum over here. And that the nucleus has a uh, 
number of monomers in it in star. So that once you could have access to some thermodynamic equilibrium between the unfolded state and the critical nucleus, out of the nucleus you could start to grow polymers. There might be some other states along here, but those states would be sort of intermediates on the way to building it. And I'm just going to skip those intermediates and go to this nucleus. The nucleus is kind of the one at the top of the mountain, and from there you can flow downhill. So if I were to extend this, I might draw a dash curve where this might be n star plus 1, this would be n star plus 2. So now I'm starting to form larger aggregates that are downhill in energy from the critical nucleus. So the picture is I have monomers which can sometimes clump together to form a, a metastable but thermodynamically accessible nucleus. Once I form that nucleus, then I can run downhill to form aggregates. I can run downhill energetically. Um, kinetic control is a little bit different. Kinetic control says there's nothing like this nucleus that you can access. And then instead, you might have a picture more like this, where the nucleus, it's a little bit like what Jose said, that you can have a, a, a globally stable state, which might be this nucleus, but if the barrier is so high, you never freaking get there. You just can't get there. So that means that um, this is protected uh, in your body from forming such a nucleus because there's a big kinetic barrier. Now you make this barrier huge compared to KBT, and then you have a hard time getting it. Why would this, so if, uh, if these pictures are of relevance, the suggestion is that this is the one that's relevant to Huntington's or Poly Q, and I'm going to give you the arguments. And this is the one that's relevant to prions. So, um, for example, in the case of the prions, uh, we know that in countries where people live long enough, it's pretty reproducible that within a factor of two, one in a million people get the prion disease every year. Okay, so the rate of incidence is one in a million per year. Um, and if this picture is right, that could explain it qualitatively or conceptually because it just says those people are thermodynamically unlucky. At some point when they were babies maybe or when they were two-year-olds or something, a few of those prion proteins got together in their brain and gave a critical nucleus or maybe a few critical nuclei. And those critical nuclei were the seed for growth, slow growth guns that eventually winds up killing them. And the age of onset for those people who get the prion disease spontaneously is about um, 63 or so. So you have to live long enough to get the disease. Okay. Um, right. So, and then on the other hand, the way that you can understand, for example, fatal familial insomnia. That's a prion disease in humans that's uh, suffered by a few families in Italy and Germany. And uh, that corresponds to, out of the 230 sequence prion protein, that corresponds to mutation at uh, position 178, where you take uh, aspartic acid and you mutate that to asparagine. That single point mutation is enough to induce the disease with 100%. Penetrance. That is, 100% of the people who uh, have that mutation, and I should say one other, um, they, they have a, the occurrence of methionine in one other place, but it's not a mutation. 100% of the people who have this mutation will get the disease. So that you go from 1 in a million to 100% probability that you're going to get the disease. And so uh, that says that the mutation does something perhaps to modulate this barrier. Um, and speed up the kinetics of the disease. So let me give you these two scenarios uh, fleshed out with a very simple phenomenology, and this result fleshed out with a very simple phenomenology that probably has been redirected many times, but I know of from this article by um, Frank Ferrone. So again, the picture is you have monomers in solution And I'll give those monomers a concentration in. You have polymers in solution, not distinguishing over the length of the polymers. I'll just call those polymers um, uh, P, undistinguished the, is the concentration of polymers, undistinguished over their, their length. Um, in between them, I have some nuclei 
which can go this way, and the nuclei have length in star and concentration in. And then what I will do is I will call m sub p the concentration of monomers in polymer form. And uh, the question is, how do I how do I go from here to here? Um, this again, this is in this. You can find a great discussion of this in the paper by Ferron, which is in the online packet of papers, Ferron, 1999, which is in the online packet of papers. How do we go from here to here? Well, basically, we can grow polymers from the nucleus by adding monomers. So we add monomers to the nuclei. And we can grow then polymers out of that. And we'll assume that that addition rate then is proportional to K plus times the uh, monomer concentration. OK. So what are the simple equations? And even though they're simple, what, what do they wind up giving us is kind of interesting. OK. so. We have then that the rate of change of the polymer concentration with respect to time is going to be K plus times the monomer concentration times the concentration of the nuclei, at least at uh, short times. That's the rate of production of new polymers um, in solution. Um, and then the rate of change of the number of monomers in the polymer form depends upon the formation of polymers. So that's going to be proportional to K plus times M times the polymer concentration. We don't care which polymer we add to. We're going to grow new monomers in polymer form by adding to the ends of polymers. This is basically a one-dimensional growth picture. You can, you can also cook up two-dimensional growth pictures, and I, I think I'll say a little bit about that tomorrow, because uh, that might be relevant to the prions. OK, so these are two simple kinetic equations. Uh, now let's add one additional assumption. Let's assume that there is a thermodynamic equilibrium. So this is a thermodynamic control. So let's assume that there's a thermodynamic equilibrium between the uh, concentration of the monomers and the concentration of the, um, the nuclei. So we're going to assume that some equilibrium constant, k sub n, times the number of monomers raised to the n star power, that's the, the size of the critical nucleus, will be equal to the concentration of the nuclei. So this is saying we have an equilibrium be, between the monomers and, and the nuclei. Uh, and the number of monomers raised to the n star power times the equilibrium constant will give us uh, the number of nuclei. So we can eliminate the, nuclear, the nuclei concentration right here. And then that just gives you um, k plus k n times m times uh, uh, m to the sorry m to the one plus n star. Okay. Now, um, so let's go ahead and solve these for short times. These are simple enough that even even I can solve them. That's nice. Okay. So if we solve this for short times, where we assume that we start out with a concentration of monomers that's large compared to the nuclei concentration or to the polymer concentration. This will give us uh, just a linear result for the number of polymers. And then we can plug that linear result in here, and that will give us that mp, the number of monomers in the form of polymers, is equal to 1 half k plus squared m to the 2 plus m star times uh, t squared times k sub n. OK. So in other words, if you're working at uh, short times, you've still got basically the same concentration of monomers in your test tube or in your cell. And so you can approximate that concentration of monomers as a constant itself. Of course, in longer times, you're going to deplete those monomers, and therefore you're going to, to saturate this curve. But you get this interesting result, which uh, is a little messy here, so let me rewrite it and put it in a box. You get this interesting result that the amount of monomer in solution is proportional to the concentration of free monomers in solution raised to the 2 plus 1 power times the time squared. Now remember, we saw this time squared law before. That's exactly what's showing up there. Those curves are fits to t squared laws. Okay? 
Um, but this tells you one other additional piece of information, which is quite useful. You can get an idea of what the size of the nucleus is if you vary the concentration of monomers. So if you make a plot, on a log log scale, if you plot the log of um, MP versus the, the coefficient of T squared, I'm sorry, that's not the right thing. You plot the log of M versus the concentrate, uh, let me do it this way. You plot the log of the T squared coefficient versus the log of M, you should see straight lines and the slope will be M star plus two, so you get an idea of what the, it gives you an idea of what the nucleus size is in this simple model. Uh, now, one interesting thing for the case of Huntington's disease, uh, or for these poly Q diseases in this test tube example, when they do this, they find that M star is equal to one. So that is, to within experimental error, it looks like the critical nucleus in this case actually is a monomer for the poly Q diseases. It doesn't have to be. But it looks like it actually is a monomer for the plot Q diseases. And that may have some implications for organizing principles. It sort of uh, suggests the possibility of some interesting magic numbers. And I'll talk about that more tomorrow. But this gives you an idea of what I mean by thermodynamic control. And it also gives you an idea that this straightforward phenomenology, in fact, gives you pretty useful information um, already about the problem. Now, um, Chen, Farone, and Wetzel did one more intriguing thing in this paper. Um, they said, okay, we're working at pretty high concentrations of this poly Q. We can make an estimate of what concentration you have of Huntington protein with a poly Q piece inside of the cell. We make that extrapolation of the T squared log here using our findings from the fit to the quadratic form. We make an extrapolation to the physiological concentration of Huntington protein and put that on a, a time plot. Well, then we're going to go beyond even graduate student time. We're going to go uh, into uh, lots of years here on a log scale. They plotted on a log scale. Here is uh, extrapolating result for what they find for a 47 um, residue long chunk of poly Q, for a 36 residue long chunk of poly Q, and for a 28 residue long chunk of poly Q. And what's interesting is this. If you look at the, uh, the most of us with, uh, well, all of us have Huntington protein in our bodies. Most of us have a number of Qs in there, which is 20 or less, okay? Now, even with 28, Take a look at where this aggregation would start to take off, and you can read it. This is about a thousand years. <laughs> so, if we extend the human lifespan to a thousand years, we all might start to be vulnerable to Huntington's disease. When you look at 36, all of a sudden this knee shows up at just past 100 years. Let me remind you that when you look over here, 36 would be right here, and that's actually sort of looking about right where it would be for Huntington's disease. And if you look at length 47, which would be, uh, let's see, right about here. That would give you about 50 years for the age of incidence on the plot here. And let's see where the knee shows up. Uh, this knee shows up right about uh, 30 years, where it starts to curve upwards on this log plot. So all this is establishing, it doesn't say a thing about why the poly Q is toxic, but it's establishing that there seems to be the possibility of correlating the, uh, the link scales, or sorry, correlating the time scales of kinetics, the time scales of simple test tube kinetics with the time scales of uh, disease incidence. And again, that seems to be possible with, um, with poly Q diseases and with preem diseases. There's a lot more players in the other diseases, which make it a richer problem to try to understand. But um, if you can understand these diseases uh, and, and argue that they're intrinsically slow kinetics, that suggests you might be onto something for the other diseases as well. Now, uh, this is, again, the idea of thermodynamic control, the idea that I can have a metastable nucleus, and out of that nucleus, I can grow my aggregates. Um, the prion problem is, yeah? But still, a Poisson process, right? Polycule disease, in a sense, it's just like the, the... Oh, sure. The that is it. Yeah. So not age dependent, in a sense, like Parkinson and uh, Parkinson or Alzheimer's, or like that one. In a sense, you could have them in a very short time, it's just very unlikely. Right, yeah, there's some distribution, it's just that that distribution is going to be peaked up, for example, depending upon length, it will be peaked up at, at some time, which seems to be sampled by these incidents times. Now, we don't know for sure with Alzheimer's and with Parkinson's, there could be some aspect of this that's relevant there, but the thing about Al Al Alzheimer's and Parkinson's is there's more than just one protein involved in the process that can contribute to the disease, so it seems to be more complicated. And there it may be that other processes of aging could be involved in, in permitting the disease to come through. Right. 
So, So this would be the mutant form right here, 
This would be the wild type form of the free energy right here. So the idea in this thermodynamic control picture is that you basically uh, take the Scrapey's form and make that stable. Now you affect that by a mutation in this picture. Um, and so then the question is, how, how much would this energy difference be? Well, it's going to be about the, the point mutation energy difference, about 3 kilocalories per mole. That's what you get from a point mutation. Or about, say, 6 to 7 kBT. For physicist reasons, I'll use 7, because 7 is 3 times 2.3, close enough for government work. So then you can work out that the population in this postulated equilibrium, the, postu the population at short times in this postulated equilibrium is going to be about e to the uh, minus delta g of the kBT times this population right here. And uh, that's going to be uh, then about, uh, well, e to the minus 7 over kBT. e to the minus 7 is about 10 to the minus 3rd. So that's why I chose uh, 7 right here. So it's about 10 to the minus 3rd times the initial concentration of the PRPC. Um, OK, so that's pretty small, but maybe alarmingly large in some ways, too. But it becomes worse. It's, it's very alarmingly large if you use uh, the exponential growth. Because now you say, OK, that means that these, let's consider the example of the poor mice or the hamsters here, where there's this doubling time of about five days. So we take a doubling time of about five days with this um, exponential factor right here. Then we would say, all right, uh, let's say that when the concentration of the infectious stuff, which is two times um, 2 to the t over t doubling time, that that's going to be um, times the concentration at short times, right after the animal was born, say. Uh, so that's going to be about 2 to the t over td times PRPSC of 0, um, which is going to be 2 to the t over td times the initial cellular concentration of PRP times uh, this uh, 10 to the minus third factor right here. And we can suppose that we're going to be in trouble for the animal if this becomes a reasonable fraction of the initial cellular PRPC concentration, because that means that we've got basically as much, almost as much of the bad stuff as we do of the good stuff, right? Um, so now if you work out the math, that tells you just by solving this equation for the, the, time, it, the time it takes to hit this condition, then you get that uh, t is going to be about nine doubling times. And with a doubling time of five days, that's about 45 days. So that would mean, if this is correct description, that would mean that every mouse or every hamster would die when they were 45 days old, well, with distribution. But they'd die when they were 45 days old or so of prion disease. And how many of you have had pet hamsters or mice? Have they lived longer than 45 days? Have they died of prion disease? No, OK. So that suggests, at least by this argument, that probably uh, thermodynamic, thermodynamic control is not going to work for the prion disease. And it's, basically, you can make the argument sharper than I made it. Um, there's a 96 paper by Manfred Eigen, which really drives the point home, that without some incredible tuning of the kinetic parameters, this thermodynamic control just is not going to work for the prion disease. So that argues that it's got to be kinetically controlled um, in this other extreme. And you can make that work. So let me go back to the example of uh, fatal familial insomnia and give you an idea of how that would work. And then I'll, I'll give you an idea about what the mechanism for the exponential growth could be. So what about the kinetic control? So OK, so now we go back to the situation where, in fact, we're going to assume that the scrapies is stable compared to the cellular form. But there's a hot and big barrier right here that present, prevents the conversion. So it takes a very long time to convert from PRPC to PRPSC. And now the idea is that the mutation is going to modulate that barrier so that the difference at the top of the barrier is going to be of the order of uh, 3 kilocalories per mole associated with the mutation. Now you may quibble. It may be that you're not actually modulating the top of the barrier, but you're destabilizing this, or perhaps stabilizing that with the mutant. I don't really care how you do it. You just do something to change the overall barrier height, meaning the difference between here and here. Okay. Um, so we still have this you know, order 6 to 7 kBT right here. Um, now, the fatal familial insomnia, the onset age for fatal familial insomnia, which corresponds to this one point mutation, the onset age is 49 years. So that tells you, if we take this at face value, that the rough 
uh, onset age, mean onset age for wild type would be 49 years times e to the absolute value of this delta g, or delta eb rather, divided by kbt. That is, this is speeded up to be within a human life window by the mutation lowering the energy barrier. So then what would be the onset age for the wild type disease? We take 49 years times e to the delta eb over kbt. And again, if I make that 7 times kbt, then this is 1,000, just to give a ballpark number. So that would be about 49,000 years. And so that would tell us that if we, we plotted up some distribution of the spontaneous form of the disease, so we plot an incubation time distribution, assuming that you could actually go out to such crazy <coughs> years. Here's 49,000 years. And then the idea is that you've got some tiny tail down here going down to 100 years, say, such that if you uh, take uh, 1 over 100 times the integrated probability weight, in this incubation time distribution, P of T, if you take 100 years divided by the integrated weight, P of T dt, you'll get about one in a million. Now, of course, this is just a conjecture. I don't have any detailed shape of that probability distribution. But it's plausible that if the peak is way out here at 49,000 years, that there is not much probability down here in the human lifespan. Okay, so that's another, another argument, again, that the prion disease could be intrinsically slow, but unlike the uh, poly Q, it, it can only be intrinsically slow by virtue of this kinetic control. And, and the argument for that uses the fact that the prions can show exponential growth, this exponential replication. So let me just quickly, um, and then I'll, I'll close with, with this for today, let me just quickly give you an idea of where the exponential growth uh, can come from. There's sort of three different processes that can give rise to exponential growth um, uh, in these simple aggregation uh, kinetics. OK. Um, And one of the things for the prion is to figure out what is the right answer for the, the mechanism of this exponential growth. OK. Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember what the next slide is. Is that no? OK. Uh, oh, let's get back to this. OK. So um, let's see. One possibility for exponential growth is to have branching. So that is to say, you allow new polymers to pop off on nucleation sites on existing polymers. And that means that you're, you're going to have a number of new polymers, which is in some way proportional to the number of old polymers, or at least proportional to the, uh, the number of monomers in polymer form, since presumably there's no preferred, no preferred branching site off of this. Uh, and that will give you the possibility of exponential growth. Another way you can do it is by heterogeneous nucleation. So this would be one, here's two. You could have heterogeneous nucleation. And this is actually close to the original spirit of the, uh, the prion problem. So I'll even give this that this is more or less the same as what's called autocatalysis. And in this picture, you'll have nuclei form um, off on the side. Of, of the existing polymer. And then, again, you're going to wind up with a situation where those nuclei can grow so that the, the number of new ones is going to be proportional to the, to the number that you started with. And therefore, that's a condition for exponential growth. And finally, uh, the other possibility is to have fission or fragmentation. And the idea there is that you just take polymers and you split them. And of course, if you split them, then like the Sorcerer's Apprentice, or like nuclear fission, you can grow new ones off of that. And so that's going to give you exponential growth as well. Uh, and if every, every site is equally possible for breakage, then in all three of these, you can make a plausible argument that you would expect that the, the rate would actually be proportional to the number of monomers in polymer form, because you could basically break it in any one of the monomer positions. So we guess that it would scale with the number of monomers in polymer form. You can come up with other arguments that would scale directly with P, but this is sufficient to give you the exponential growth. 
And it also will give you, interestingly, the same t squared behavior. So uh, uh, what I'll do is write down the equations. And I can, uh, for those who are interested, I can tell you how uh, one way you can derive it. Given the equations, you can check that the solutions will just satisfy these equations. But now we just modify the equations to the following form. The PDT equal to k plus m times n star plus phi um, k plus m n star times mp. So here's the proportionality to the number of polymers, uh, the number of monomers in polymer form. And this is just a sort of uh, the fraction of sites that can participate, whether it's uh, branching, um, heterogeneous nucleation, or um, fission. And this would be the same as before. Okay? And now uh, the solution to these equations, um, as long as we take constant m and constant n star, the solution to these equations is the following. Uh, let me just write down the answer. If you're, again, if you're interested, I can tell you how to derive it, but that's probably not the most important aspect. It's sort of interesting to look at the form. Um, the solution is that P of T is equal to 1 over the square root of this fraction that can uh, participate in the process times the cinch of um, the square root of phi times n star times m times t times k plus. And m p of t is equal to 1 over phi times the cosh of the square root of phi times k plus n star m times t minus 1. Now, obviously, in this case, when you go to long enough times, you're going to get exponential growth. You're going to see that both the number of polymers and the number of monomers in polymer form explodes. But if you go to short times, this grows linearly. And in fact, it has the same form that we talked about before. The, the square root of phi will cancel out. You have k plus m times n star times t at short times here. And at short times here, you wind up with the same form. One half, um, let's see, k plus, um, I'm sorry. One half k plus. Uh, let's see, there should be an n star down here. One half k plus n star uh, m squared times t squared. And so, yeah, there should be an n star down there. And this is right. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so you wind up with the same forms at short times. You get this t squared behavior at short times, but you also get this exponential growth. Now, um, why do I call this autocatalysis over here? Because basically, I'm catalyzing the growth of these nuclei off of the original, uh, I'm catalyzing the growth of these nuclei off of the scrapeous form. So it's as if though I take infectious stuff, sorry, I take normal stuff, bring it up, and then I catalyze the formation of infectious stuff, and then it drops away, and then I can do it again. Whenever I have autocatalysis, I'm going to get exponential growth. And so this heterogeneous nucleation is, is another way in this model of describing autocatalysis. And this branching clearly does not seem to apply to the prion. So one of the questions in the prion game is whether the ex exponential growth that's observed is due to um, this kind of heterogeneous catalysis, uh, autocatalysis, or whether it's too deficient. Uh, and maybe just to give some discussion, I'll click, I'll leave this up, and then I'll go ahead and start the discussion. This is uh, just um, why prions are interesting, in case you haven't already picked up on some of that. Uh, so maybe I'll throw it open for discussion right now. But it's got about a half an hour left here. So what questions might you have about uh, any of this? Yeah. So when you talk about having the normal state, which is here, then a large barrier for right. the, the prion, and you say that it's never dynamically unlucky, is there any evidence of maybe a catalyst that is kind of taking it over the barrier? Oh, that's a great question. In fact, um, it has been postulated. Uh, and I should have mentioned, by the way, that if you, I should have mentioned as well, that if you make an assumption about the molecular time scale, that you can work out what the height of that barrier has to be. And the height of that barrier has to be about uh, 60 kT. Right? So in order, in order to get the 49,000 years from a molecular time scale, you need about 60 kT, or about 30 kilocalories per mole. But yeah, so that's a great question, actually. Um, one of the things, based upon uh, some transgenic data that the Prusner group came up with a long time ago, 
was that suggestion that there was a protein X that actually assisted in the conversion of the prion uh, to the infectious form in vivo. And they set about to search for that protein X, and to date it hasn't been identified. Now, one of the interesting things that might connect to our fellow organizers' um, uh, work here is, okay, the prion is supposed to be protein only, right? Okay, if it's protein only, why can't you grow the right form in a test tube and infect animals? People try. And I'll go through three experiments that people have done and tell you why at least two of those experiments are problematic in convincing people 100% that it's protein only. I'd say, I'd say if you go out in the prion community, I don't know the egregious, but I'd say if you go out in the prion community, it's sort of at the 99% level that it's protein only, with a few very vocal outliers uh, to like small viral particles or something. Okay. Okay, so one of the experiments was done in the Prusner lab in collaboration with um, Baskinkoff, Ilya Baskinkoff, who's at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Uh, that experiment was the following. You grow fibrils of prion in a test tube, and you actually inject those fibrils into animals. You grow fibrils of recombinant prion protein that's never been exposed to mammalian brains before, and you inoculate mammalian brains with those, mice brains in this case. And the mice get sick. And the mice get sick in such a way that mice who have whole fibrils injected come up with a slightly different form of the disease than mice where they've broken up the fibrils by sonication, by hitting up with ultrasound. That's pretty interesting. Now, what's the complaint against that experiment? It sounds beautiful. What's wrong with that experiment? In order to get those mice sick, they had to put 16 copies of the prion gene into the mice. And there's a question about whether if you have 16 copies of the prion gene, you might have already ramped up the concentration of PRPC enough that the mice are on the edge of being sick anyway from normal prion disease. That doesn't, you know, so maybe you tip the balance a little bit towards, towards prion disease. So that, that's the problem with that experiment. There's another experiment. Yeah. 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 So that's that's a good reason for it. Yeah, that's a good reason for, for skepticism. Another experimental that, that came to similar conclusions by slightly different means was by uh, Claudio, uh, uh, what's his name? Claudio, Claudio Soto, thank you. Claudio Soto, what they do is an experiment where they take out brain extract, purify it, and then they will basically um, break it up, dilute it, break it up with ultrasound, dilute it. So they dilute it to such a point that there could not have been any of the, uh, they, uh, they keep the feedstock is, okay, sorry. They take the brain stuff, which gives them the PRP scrapies form. They take feedstock of normal PRP recombinant. So it has never been exposed to mammalian brains. They put that in to grow new stuff. Then they keep diluting it to a point where their dilution level is such that there's, you know, essentially zero probability that you have any of the original infectious prion protein in your sample. Okay? The problem is that the conditions when they replicate it also require that they have other stuff present, like um, right. potentially nucleic acids. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's not completely clean. Now, what has been done more recently by uh, Sapatopone at Dartmouth is he's done experiments where he's been able to uh, produce infectious material with normal, with, sorry, with uh, recombinant PRP and with some uh, uh, um, polyions like RNA. And he can change the sequence of the polyanions, so there's nothing sequence specific about the RNA, for example, that does it. And that suggests that the RNA could either play a role, a critical role in conversion in vivo, or maybe it's a, a catalytic role. It may be a catalytic role as well. And um, perhaps you'll say something, I don't know, about, about similar experiments in, in your group, right? Yeah. So that's, uh, that's a long answer to your question. Uh, any, any other uh, uh, questions? Maybe for most of the amyloid disease, maybe you would have something in between the thermodynamic and kinetic control. So you can have, and then, of course, that's, that's complicated because yeah. in some cases you have uh, some amyloids that can be seeded, and in some cases they, they cannot be seeded. So, right. And then, and then you have uh, somewhere in between, I mean, depending on the condition. I think in the case of the prion, you need, like, I think you how to show that. The, the most infectious particle has about uh, 500,000 molecular weight. I mean, just, yeah, I think so they came up with an estimate of somewhere. Be, oh, the most infectious, right? The minimal yeah. infectious is probably three to six yeah. monomers, and the most infectious, 500,000. I think about uh, that's around uh, 20, around 20 monomers. There. Right. Right. So, but I think, do you think this can be modeled? I mean, if you assume 
both possibilities or makes the other? Yeah, I mean, I, almost, I sort of picked the two extreme cases. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I sort of picked the two extreme cases. And even in the kinetic controlled case, there's probably intermediates. They may not be intermediates that themselves will lead to stable aggregates, but there's probably intermediates in the kinetically controlled case as well, um, which uh, require you to talk a little bit more in detail about structure. Let's see, what other questions might you have? Okay. Uh, well, let me, let me ask, was, was there anything that wasn't clear? What wasn't clear about the lecture? Aha, now there's some strings in the audience. Be, be, feel free to, to say what wasn't clear. Oh, it was clear. Oh. Oh, I'm going to talk about that some tomorrow. Yeah, right. But but yeah, because there's that's that's an interesting question in its own right. Okay. So any, anything else? Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so this is quite different from the folding problem. It's more aggregation problem. So the folding problem, at least in, in MD, you can try to simulate for it. Oh well, Short yes. Like that's a good question. How do right. You do, like, right. Right. How do you approach this problem? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean. What okay, so you're not going to easily simulate. I mean, what, what people have done with all atom MD is they've sim simulated aggregation of small fragments. When I say small, I mean small, like maybe four to six amino acids, something like that. Okay, uh, and so they've simulated aggregation of that. What Carol Hall has done is simulation of much larger peptides with much larger number of aggregates with something that she calls uh, discrete MD. Uh, basically, it's a coarse grain method where all amino acids are treated the same, and they just have a, if they come into contact, they have a square wall. The advantage of the square wall potential is that you can integrate it exactly uh, analytically for any step of interaction, and therefore it makes the molecular dynamics go very fast and allow you to do very large size. It's obviously not very specific, and yet she's been able to see beta aggregates form. She has a nice meet of beta aggregates forming that way. But if you want to try to see, for example, the prion protein, which is uh, of length 230, and which the um, aggregation region is at least of length probably 50 or 60 that's implicated disease, then you're not going to get there easily from all atom MD. So the game that you can play, which I'll say a little bit more about tomorrow, the game that you can do instead is to try to, to, to guess some potentially stable and then see how well they hold up the out of those structures. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that um, tomorrow in more detail. But in other words, you have to sort of pick beta motif, argue that those are relevant, and, and try to argue for this. You're not going to try to see the thing fold into those. You're going to see uh, whether it can maybe unfold out of those. You're going to try to see how, how stable those are. Not completely accurate. Another thing that's been done is what uh, Valerie Daggett and also um, my friend at Washington University, Pete Papu, have done, uh, where they have done simulations where they look, try to conditions that would, would um, destabilize the cellular form. And then look to see if they can find intermediate structures, potential intermediate structures that could lead to possible uh, interesting stable structures. But they don't see the full conversion, right, from from uh, from PRP to stable structure. What they see is, is sort of what I was describing. They see some interesting unfolded things. You have two choices. You can try to create stable guesses for what the aggregate structure would be and try to unfold it, or you can start from PRPC and try to unfold that. And in, in any case, then see what, what what's maybe there on some some passes, some mountain passes in the energy landscape. And in Valerie's case, she proposed a very interesting model uh, for the PRPC, which has a beta strand structure sort of would be 45 degrees to the axis. It fits an incredible amount of data, except that it doesn't explain the fibril data because fibrils require that those beta strands be perpendicular to the axis. But it fits an incredible amount of other data. Uh, uh, so so those are kinds of modeling possibilities that you can do. Uh, either using the MD to sort of guide you to some guesses to structures by coming from the unfolded or the normal state, or using the uh, BMD to check out possible stable structures. My, my group, we're, we're sort of all in the, the latter category, um, partly because you have to be much bigger simulation jocks in the, uh, in the former category than I've, than I've been capable of so far. But yeah, and th that's an honorable route. Though. So hopefully that clarifies your, your question somewhat. What about other things like multiple viruses in life? Oh, well, yeah, that's another thing you can do. Uh, it, still, it still doesn't quite get you around the, uh, the search problem that, you know, for example, Linus Pauling, as far as I know, predicted the existence of the alpha helix before it was discovered, okay, which is really amazing. 
But it's not completely amazing when you think about the fact that the alpha helix has very local hydrogen bonding structure. That beta helix, uh, which I'll talk about tomorrow, and which I sketched a little bit today, the simplest beta helix is one that has a left-handed pitch to it. So as you go from the end of the C terminus, you move up on your left thumb. That has an 18 amino acid repeat to it. Now that's not predictable easily. Uh, coming back to where, where, where are you? Ah, that might be emergent. <laughs> How do you get 18 amino acids out from any simple theory? I don't know. Um, but, but anyway, 18 amino acids is pretty remarkable. And we student Robert Hare sort of trying a Monte Carlo method within a constrained space that is saying, look, I'm going to constrain my space so that I only look at helical structures. And it's hard to do. I mean, he could easily get the alpha helix, the 310 helix, and the pi helix. But once you go to things that are non-local with sort of non-uniform by size, non-uniform torsion angles, it's, it's very hard because, again, it's sort of the, the, the search problem rears up in your face. So we're being, uh, we're, we're resorting to a simplified problem for it uh, rather than trying to explain the, the beta helix. Yeah? I have one question. I'm an experimentalist. Sure. And what they're looking at, for us, a few times, 113, and they're able to quantify the number of vitals using, um, well, sort of correlation, spectroscopy based. So, my question to you now is that Kumar will from the extract, because she found that there's different aggregation um, numbers in the nucleus versus in the cytoplasm of the cells that she's looking at. And specifically, she was looking at PC12 and um, COSQ sound. Again, the biologists will know better than I I'm a right. physicist. Right. But anyway, I like this. So back to the point. The point is now from that data, they found different diffusion rates. Could you then go back and form the theory? That's an interesting question. Um, I, the, what, the first thing that comes to mind is um, what are the what are, I mean the conditions in the nucleus and the cytosol are different, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, in the prion case, uh, not going between nucleus and cytosol, but the prions are transported out to they live on the cell surface. They're transported out to the cell surface by uh, vesicles which have low pH, and they're also cycled back in, the normal prions are cycled back in by vesicles which have low pH. The pH can get down to the ballpark of five, uh, in fact, in these vesicles, whereas in the cytosol and in the uh, intracellular medium, it's around seven. I don't know what it is in the nucleus offhand, but there are different conditions in the nucleus than there are in the cytosol. There's also other things present in the cytosol. So I can imagine that if you could, that, that gives you some insight into what the different conditions are. And one thing that we're interested in is the idea that, that uh, the pH could actually trigger different possible structures on, on, on the prion because it allows, for example, under varying conditions of pH for, for structures where histamines will point in or out of some beta structure, where uh, aspartic acids will point in or out of some beta structure. So changing the pH can also change what structures are available. Um, and so that might get into a question of a little bit more detail on the structural level, but it's also one that's, that's interesting to even ask, can you, can you, can you make some phenomenal, uh, phenomenological characterization? Well, my first guess is, what are the different conditions in, in, the, in the two different environments? Um, did you have a, another comment or question? Oh, that, 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 okay. Yeah, uh, the uh, well, there are a lot of work on the yeast green, so yeah. I mean, you have a... Um, Especially because it's much easier to work with the into than mammalian, so yeah. So um, then you you have a lot of kinetic data. So yeah. Um, well, the kinetic data. Well, so the, this is an interesting question. That um, in fact, um, this this kind of kinetic modeling that I described with a little bit more explicit detail about the polymer growth can really describe the yeast prions beautifully. So so the idea is that, that there there are also proteins in yeast which have this property of being uh, able to self replicate. Well, in the yeast, they're not causing disease. They can be, they can be passed from a, a mother to daughter cell, and they're a kind of inheritance which is outside the genome. They're a non-Mendelian inheritance, which is pretty fascinating. Now, they're not the most interesting inheritable thing because it's like a one or zero. You either have it or you don't. So you can't get as much information stored in yeast prions as you can in the original genome. But still, it's an interesting thing. And uh, in fact, there's a prion in another fungus. Uh, this is the, uh, the HET S prion. This is the fungus which you can find uh, growing underneath the soil, like in northern Michigan, uh, where, you know, this was, I remember about 10 or 20 years ago, they said the biggest organism we've ever found is this clump of uh, fungal uh, cells all lumped together in the soil of northern Michigan. It extended like, I don't know, what was it, 20 miles or something. It's this huge clump of fungus that was growing underneath the soil. 
What this prion does is when the fungal cells come together, if the prion is turned on, it tells the fungal cells that they can exchange nucleic acid. If the prion is turned off, then those fungal cells won't exchange nucleic acid. So it's actually critical for the network building, uh, for the ICAM, if you will, of the, of the, uh, of the, the fungal uh, prions. Now, in the yeast prions, uh, uh, the, the different colors here actually tell you whether the, the, the daughter cell is, is present with yeast that's pink or, or absent of the yeast prion that's red. So these are different colonies of yeast grown here, and you will faithfully replicate the, the yeast uh, as you grow uh, mother and daughter cells. You can also grow the yeast prion in, vivo, uh, sorry, in vitro, and it's nice to work with because you don't have to worry about any uh, uh, biohazard uh, uh, complications. You know, nobody's going to get sick from yeast prions. Okay? Um, and in fact, it's actually a completely different protein structure or protein sequence than the mammalian prion. It just happens to have these same properties. Now, what, one of the things that's interesting is you, you easily grow these one-dimensional fibrils of the yeast prion uh, in vitro, and you can model the kinetics of that with, with this kinds of kinetics I just talked about, where you have fission, where you have fragmentation of the yeast prion, and you have this linear growth of the yeast prion. This picture is from Jonathan Weissman's lab, and there's one other interesting thing in this picture. Prions have strains, okay? Now, if you think about strains of flu, you know that the strain of the flu is encoded in what? It's enco encoded in the genome of the virus, right? Um, you can have strains of bacteria, again, that's encoded in the genome of that virus. How do you, if you don't have a genome, how do you encode strain? How do you encode strain if you don't have a genome? In other words, if you have, for example, different strains of mammalian prion disease, you'll find out they have different incubation times. The tissues in the brain which they attack are slightly different. You'll have different concentrations in different parts of the brain. You'll also, <coughs> the prion protein is glycosylated in translation. So you'll have different levels of sugars on the prion protein. So there's different markers of strains, and really, and, they, and the thing is that, that strain propagates true, just like a strain of a bacteria or virus. So if you don't have um, nucleic acid, how do you encode? How do you encode confirmation? I'll throw that out there as a riddle to you. The people from Davis can answer. <laughs> what did I just say? I think I gave the hint in way. How do you encode? <laughs> how do you encode strain without nucleic acids? Right. I hope you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> but if you did, that's okay. Did, did, did anybody have a good guess? Sorry? Yeah, confirmation, <laughs> like I said. <laughs> and this is proven for the yeast prions. This thick object right here, this is AFM, atomic force microscopy studies of yeast uh, prions. This thick structure right here is 